Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 20. Today joining me is my wife, Amber. Say hello. Hi, everyone. And we're going to be talking about what Amber so elegantly describes as manipulation in board games, which is how she says she wins board games, but I think she's just good at them. It's manipulation or not. I think we'll discuss what that means further. It's not as bad as it sounds, don't worry. Yes, but then that... Why do you call it that, then? Because I don't have a better word. Okay. Well, let's begin, then, by having you try to define it. What is manipulation in board games? Well, I guess I should preface this by saying that when we play games with Amber, which is largely the game's that she enjoys, which are generally big, combat-heavy, attacking, mean kind of games. Cause... I don't think they're mean. It's yeah, not... well, they're, they're meaner than Euro games, usually. You're not yeah. as big of a fan of, of Euros as you are kind of more Ameritrashy games. Right. What we find is that Amber usually doesn't conform to our ideas of a good strategy and then she ends up doing better than we expect and then one time we asked her okay what is what are you trying to do here like do you have a plan because it seems kind of random and you said oh i just manipulate you guys and we're like what and then you were like what you guys aren't doing that too and so thus this podcast idea was born so tell me, Amber, what is this manipulative secret that lets you win, or more frequently come in second place a lot? It's true. Second second place is my curse. Haven't you gotten second like four out of the eight times you've played Twilight Imperium? I always get second. Yeah. I've won Twilight Imperium twice, but second place, and then more recently, last place, which was a shame. It's the worst I've ever Wait, done. you came in last? I did. Oh, in our last game of TI. I did. But other than that, it was first and second all I the I forgot way. about that. Yeah. Wait, who won that? Did I win that one? No, no, no. Who um, won that one? Did Jeff win? No, Jeff Orion won. won that one. Oh, Orion, yeah. Yeah, he's, Orion won that one. He's usually the one who wins it. Sometimes. No, he, he wins it occasionally. He's won two or three times. Yeah. Well, he's, I don't think I've ever won Twilight Imperium. You have not. Anyway, just, just so you all know, Twilight Imperium is Amber's favorite game, which should tell you something. What are some other games you really like? I've really enjoyed the coin games. Oh, not, that's right. Not yeah. so much Fire in the Lake, um, but what's the one? Falling called? Sky. I really enjoyed Falling Sky. Um, you like Dominant Species? I loved Dominant Species. What else did I like? I don't know. Games have to have some kind of attack mechanism. For me to really enjoy them. Yeah, we've been trying to get you to play Terra Mystica for I months have and months. Zero interest in that game. But it's such a good game. Mm, zero interest. Well, in in specifically, not only do you like attacking games, but usually like multiplayer games. So you haven't. That's very important, and we'll get into that later as well. I am one on one games are are fine. They're fun. But manipulation really only works if you have multiple players in the game. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what two-player games do you even enjoy. You kind of like Twilight Struggle, right? If I could remember how to coup, I would love Twilight Struggle, <laughs> but I can't remember, so... No. You like Memoir. I do like Memoir. Memoir is good. Although you said it's emotionally draining, right? For you? Did I? That's what you told me, because I was like, let's just spend a whole afternoon yeah, and play it, through like four memoir scenarios. One scenario is plenty. I don't know if it's emotionally draining, but it is, it, it's taxing. It takes something out of me. Yeah. What are some Euro games you like, though? I really enjoy Power Grid. Oh, yeah, Power Grid. You like Tzolkin, right? Not so much. You don't like Tzolkin? No, I'm not a big fan. Huh. We haven't gotten you to play Scythe yet. No. I'm trying to see what other games around here. I like Castles of Burgundy. I like, like Viticulture, right? Viticulture is fun. Yeah. We gotta get you to play Concordia. Oh, yeah. That one did sound interesting. Yeah. Anyway, but most of the time you enjoy the bigger, combat-heavy, attacking, defending. Is there a particular... Is it because you can employ these manipulative tactics? 
No, I I just enjoy the fact that they're more interactive. And so, yes, my tactics do always come into play in these games, but that's not necessarily why I enjoy playing them. Yeah. I just find them more fun, more interesting. And I guess when I'm playing the game, I would say you guys are playing the game, but I'm playing the game on a different level. With air quotes. Yeah. Um... It's actually shocking to me that Mark and Orion find my moves and my decisions in the board games confusing because they make perfect sense to me. And I think that we've decided that I do play them differently and figuring out how and why has been difficult, more difficult than it should be. Although I will say I was absolutely shocked when their response to my comment that I was manipulating them was, what? (laughs) I don't know how anyone is surprised about this. And so this podcast, I guess, will get into the details of why I play that way. And I really want to hear Mark's comments about why that's shocking and specifically his comments to some of the tactics that I employ. Well, here's the thing. Here's here's where we've run into... I say trouble, not really trouble, when we're playing games with you. Mm -hmm. And that is when it's a multiplayer game, like Mm -hmm. we've had this situation in Dominant Species recently, and one person is poised to take Mm -hmm. a big lead. Mm -hmm. And then we recognize that that person needs to be stopped or the game becomes a fight for second place. Mm -hmm. So we appeal to Amber. We say, Amber, help us in our quest to make sure that this one person does not run away with first place. And you look down on us peons and you say, no, I will not help you. Well, the the simple reason for that is I know all of you see it. And I know that all of you will want to stop it. And so the question is, how do I come out on top? while doing what I can to make sure that this person doesn't win. But I'm not going to sacrifice myself. I know that you will, you guys will do that for me. It, and it's something that I almost can take for granted in our little game playing group. That's it, an interesting dynamic because mm-hmm. it makes you kind of the the bad guy in the kind of the game theory situation. Mm-hmm. But... Eventually, we're going to stop doing it. Well, you guys did do it once to me, particularly when we were playing Archipelago. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You guys, you got so mad at me for not sacrificing myself that I sacrificed myself. And I made a move that saved the group and lost me the game. And what did I find out later? That two of you, I think it was Mark and Ben, had the chance to save the group. And just made me do it instead. And But that's kind of what I'm doing to all of you. Okay, for those who don't know Archipelago, it's basically a competitive game with group loss conditions imposed upon it that you have to negotiate amongst each other. So it'll be like, you have to contribute six total wood. Mm-hmm. And then you either do it or you don't. Not lost conditions. Sometimes they can be effectively lost conditions, but it'll right. it'll push uh, ahead the loss, the group loss condition. Right. And if I remember correctly, in that situation, it was an appeal to fairness and equity that everyone contribute roughly the same amount. I don't remember it that way at all. I yes. just remember being bullied into contributing. Well, it was bullied with the pretext of fairness. Although I did gain a bit from it. So I guess in that sense, I was playing like you. Exactly. So I think that you and Orion and everyone should understand a little bit where I'm coming from. And that's why I'm a little bit surprised that it seems to be confusing sometimes. Well, here's the interesting (laughs) thing. The thing that surprised me and what gave me this idea for the podcast was the game of Dominant Species. Oh, where. It was the same kind of situation where one person was going to run away and we're like, oh, we need to stop them. And you were in the best position to stop him. Mm -hmm. I think it was Matt. And Orion and I were like, please stop him. Mm -hmm. And you just flat out refused to. So we tried to. Mm -hmm. 
And after the game, we are talking, and you thought that we were legitimately trying to get an edge on you and con you in some way. I did. When we were honestly like, you're in the best position to stop him. Didn't I win that game? I think you did. Yeah, and I think I won it because you guys were so preoccupied with stopping Matt or or Ryan or whoever was in the lead that I was able to just sneak up, take over all of Mark's territories by becoming dominant and adapting my food sources, taking over everything that he had, and I got, what, a 30, 40-point swing? Yeah. And ran ahead? So anyway, there's some merit... (laughs) <laughs> to your manipulative strategies. Okay, tell me about it. What does it, what do you think, or what are you trying to say when you say that you use social manipulation in games? You gotta find a better name for that. It sounds dirty just coming know, out of my I mouth. Know, I know, but okay, so I take a look at the way, at least the way I perceive that Orion plays games. And I perceive the way Orion plays games to be polar opposite from the way I play games, where he is looking at board board position, resources, and he comes up with a long-term strategy, and he knows at any moment what all of his pieces are doing, what all of his strategy is. Yes. And I play the game completely opposite, where I am playing in the moment, adapting to everything. I don't generally have a long-term strategy. You know, you, you have a general sense of what's going on in the game, but certainly not as detailed. And I'm looking at what Orion's doing, and I'm looking at what Mark is doing, and I'm trying to figure out how to get a little bit of an edge in the moment, which often involves playing them off of each other, or even like when Ben or Matt are playing games with us. Finding something to create a point of conflict between at least two other players as a distraction from what I'm doing or to not interfere with what I perceive to be the best move. And so it's it's creating dynamics in the game where people are more likely to face off against each other and not me, or a situation where I can jump ahead because everyone's ignoring me or leaving options open because they don't fit into their long-term strategy, but they're good for me in the moment. And so it, it's paying more attention to the way other people are playing the game than it is to how they're positioned on the board or what kinds of long-term strategies they're involved with. So what you're saying is you're not so much looking at the reality of the board position or the game state. You're looking at kind of the psychology of everyone. And I don't think I'm particularly good at it. Um, I don't pretend to be the best at board games. I I think that I would be a lot better at board games if I was better at doing this. Um, I'm not the most socially or emotionally aware person, but I am more so than most of our regular game group. And I think that that gives me a little bit of an edge when playing the game in that way. And and you you do this even during Euro games, right? Like, you're, you're still considering it, even yes. if there's indirect conflict? And And I've discussed this with you before, and I know I've discussed it with Orion before, and Orion just, like... Does not understand <laughs> at all. It's very amusing. I, I can't really describe what I'm doing all the time because it's all subconscious. and It's I've, like a frame of mind. Yeah, I've only recently become aware enough to even mention it and discuss it after we're playing the board games. And mostly because Mark is forcing me to, saying, why do you play this way? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm I'm looking more at the players than I am at the board. And I would say that that's pretty consistent in every game. I'm looking at my hand uh, of cards. I'm looking at my resources and other players and trying to come up with moves and strategies off of that. It's so foreign to me. <laughs> like you hardly do any calculation. It's true, at least not consciously. I have to bring this up. Mm-hmm. Amber and I have had a long-standing argument <laughs> over the value of calculating odds. I get I guess very in, annoyed at odds. I guess in board games it's different because there are actual concrete odds. Or are you still annoyed by that? 
Well, okay. One thing to point out is I very strongly believe in luck and Mark does not. Mark believes in odds. You don't actually maybe, believe in luck. Maybe they're similar. Like maybe they're the same thing in the but end. You don't actually believe in luck, right? It, it depends. Like luck is such a fluffy concept. Uh, like, do I believe in it as a mysterious force in the universe? Yeah, metaphysically, you no, don't believe in luck. But I believe that when you roll the dice, sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. So I... Well, but okay. But that's saying the same thing as sometimes when you roll the dice, sometimes you get a favorable outcome and sometimes you don't. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that your focus on odds and my emphasis on luck is probably similar But it's framed differently in your mind. Yes, yes. Well, what you really hate is when we try to create the odds of something when that's impossible. We're just estimating. It's it's about feeling. You want to attack someone else's ships? Don't calculate the battle before the battle happens. You either attack or you don't. You go for it or you you (laughs) sit around and do nothing. You can kind of get a feel for how many ships you have, how many ships they have, and, and play it out sure. there. And luck is very important. You have to feel lucky. Oh, dear. It, yeah. <laughs> Amber, this is destroying me. I don't know why. Okay. Mm. I, I think <laughs> I have a bit of a grasp of what you're talking about. Yeah. You play instinctually. That's what it is. That's how it's fun. It's not fun to sit and calculate it out. Depends on the game. Better games, it is fun to calculate it out because the game still remains interesting. You don't agree with me. Not necessarily, no. Um, You know what this reminds me of when I was reading before a while ago? I was reading something about chess. And way back in the day, like in the 19th or 18th century or whatever... There was a big kind of like philosophical debate among chess people about playing the technically correct move versus playing the most beautiful move. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you were a chess grandmaster in 1850, you would be on the camp of the most beautiful move. 100% absolutely. But why? This is how I live my life. Okay, okay, that's that's as much as I'm probably going to get out of you on this. It still doesn't make any sense to me. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's pull back a bit yeah. and talk about this from a broader perspective. Let's lay some, some groundwork. So in our game group, we have this thing we call the game bubble. And it's an idea we came up with when we were playing Resistance like two or three times a week. And the idea is that... When you start a game, you enter the game bubble, and then you could do whatever you want. Well, not whatever you want. You can you can lie and manipulate or whatever. And then once the game is over, you leave the bubble, and everything that happened in the bubble doesn't really matter. Important note, though, the rules of the game are absolute. There's no cheating around the rules. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rules must be transparent. But specifically that. in the context of the resistance, you can, like, mm-hmm. promise someone or, like, look them dead in the eyes and lie, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Because you have to do that with those kinds of games. And, and the reason we created this, and I think Matt came up with the idea, is that he was playing Resistance with other groups, and there were some people who really didn't like lying, and they felt really uncomfortable. So he's like, okay, guys, it's just in the context of the game. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, that it's a nebulous idea. We haven't like defined rules for it, and it changes with the game. Mm-hmm. Like something that might be socially permissible in the Resistance wouldn't fly when playing, I don't know, Sezulkin. It depends on the context of the game. But it's our idea to say, hey, we'll loosen kind of the social norms a bit because it makes the game fun. I don't have a specific reason of defining that right now. I just wanted to lay the groundwork. Yeah. So that's the game bubble. And aligned with that concept is this idea... You hear a lot, particularly with with some kinds of games, about metagaming. You hear about a lot in the context of role-playing games where you're not supposed to bring... You're supposed to stay in character. But in other kinds of games, the idea of metagaming is that you shouldn't let your relationships with people 
affect how you game. So if you really find someone annoying, you shouldn't target them at the expense. Everyone should be playing to win the game in the context of the game. I think your social manipulation idea, because I find it intriguing and because I've seen it play out and it hasn't been, it it hasn't failed like the spell test of that seems wrong, fits within the game bubble, but outside this negative idea of metagaming. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, um, you first introduced the idea of metagaming to me, and I found it interesting because it's really hard to get out of your personal relationships, and it's really difficult to focus only on the game. Of course there are things that you shouldn't bring into the game. Um, Mark brought up the example earlier about, like, Mark shouldn't go easy on me just because I'm his wife. It doesn't make for a fun gaming experience for everyone. I think it it lessens the value of the game and kind of cheapens the experience. Right. But at the same time, when you're playing a game, it it's awkward and kind of a foreign idea to me that you just have the pieces at your disposal and the whole thing is contained within a box because the people playing the game all have different styles, all have different mindsets, all have different strategies. And so to not use that knowledge um, or to try and ignore it and focus only on the board is really difficult. Um, And it's something I never thought about doing. Um, Using knowledge of other people is just something that comes naturally. And I don't know, maybe this is... Well, I think it comes naturally to everyone, but I think you're more... You do it more purposefully than in the rest of us. I, I will say that it's possible that my approach to board gaming was formed from early childhood plays of Monopoly. Oh, God. Oh, with, no. With my six siblings. Didn't you guys in, just cheat all In over which the place? I was the queen of cheating and manip- manipulation and lying and loan sharking and all of that activity. Um, well, to be fair, I think being a loan shark in Monopoly is within the rules. Depends. <laughs> I, I was a benevolent loan shark, stringing people along, extracting every single last bit of cash before I finally declared that they could not take any more credit. <laughs> I think what we're learning here is that you were a terrifying child. I think so. I think my, my siblings would agree as well. And, yeah. and maybe that's shaped my experience with board games. I certainly don't play every board game like that. Let's be real. Monopoly is a special situation. It's Being all a about, small child is a special si- it, it's situation. It's all about house rules. Um, so playing the board games that we play now is a very different experience. Sure. But in, in trying to conceptualize this idea that you're, you're presenting to me, I think the distinction between what you do, which seems, again, seems on first glance and playing against you, like I've never had a problem with it. Well, honestly, I didn't know you were doing it till you mentioned it to us. And the kind of metagaming situations that people generally get mad about is that you're taking your knowledge of how people act within the game not how the people are outside the game and using that knowledge to shape your, whatever your secret connivings you're doing rather than, let's be honest, a situation where, oh, you're attacking me because you think it's funny to attack your husband. Right. Um, Which I, I think you probably have done before as well. Well, if there's a choice between you and someone else and I'm really mad at you, Okay, maybe. And I'm not proud of that. That's not necessarily the way games should be played. But maybe I've done it before. Um, But you're right that I'm taking it from more of a perspective of what people are doing within the game. I don't necessarily think it's fun to play a game and bring in all of this outside. No, it it, it defeats... Exactly. I very much play in the spirit of the game. Right. And I think that's the only way it's fun. Uh, Or also defeats the entire purpose of playing a game, which is to get in a situation outside of your normal thought processes or context. I also think it's a natural extension of playing games like chess or checkers, where you are studying your opponent just as much as you're studying board position. 
And to some degree, it's a statistical, calculated game where there are ideal moves. But also, to other degrees, you're studying your opponent and what your opponent is likely to do or not as likely to do. And and you're playing it on that different level as well. At least some people. Um, So I don't find it to be a foreign concept or a different way to play the game. And I was honestly surprised when Mark was surprised that I do this within the game. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention that the group dynamics and the rules you have within your board game group is important. I, I wouldn't do anything that the group thinks is evil or <laughs> particularly inappropriate. Well, of course. Um, I, I enjoy playing games with everybody and it's all about making the experience good for everybody. And another thing to point out on this is since I'm making the experience good for everybody, a lot of times there are optimal moves that I can take that I think are just too mean or that just make the fun the, the game no fun. And so I will choose not to do those. By optimal moves, you mean like actual like, moves in the game like, or some kind of like comment you would make to try to... Actual moves, like wiping a player out in a game... It's just no fun. I don't enjoy doing that. See, that's the thing that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Well, last time we played Twilight Imperium, Jeff had a great opportunity to wipe me out fairly early in the game. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that, and that probably would have put him in a better position to win. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I wasn't going to do that. Like, you're hosting the game. It's your game. And I agree. I wouldn't do that to you. I agree with him. And I'm like, oh, you could have done it. To me, like, if, if you enter a board game in which being eliminated from the game is an option, as long as someone's not doing it out of spite or just to be mean to the person, as long as it's a strategically good move, I'm fine with it. To me, because it's within the bounds of the rules, that you should be prepared for it. Like, 80, 95% of the games we own, you cannot be eliminated from. So, when we do play one where you can be eliminated... That seems to be part of the game to me. But I guess, like, literally no one agrees with me, so I won't be wiping anyone out anytime soon. It's not that I disagree with you. I think it's fine to do. I wouldn't... Well, I would be mad, but I wouldn't be that mad at you if you wiped me out. I just don't think it's as fun. Um, when, When I sit down to play a game, there's a specific social circle that's created... And the destruction of one member of that circle is a big deal, and it changes everything. And I think, emotionally, I'm not prepared for that change. Hmm. And I I just don't prefer to play games that way. Okay, so we've highlighted that as one thing that you think would be too far. Mm -hmm. What are some other, just to kind of, again, define what you mean by social manipulation, what are things that you would say are too much? So inappropriate tactics to use, right? Yes. I don't think that I don't think that anything that messes with the rules is okay. Sure, that's a given. Um, that's hiding rules. That's stretching rules. And okay, stretching rules. I will say that I do read the rules differently than other people at times. I'm an attorney. I read things very closely and sometimes come up with a different meaning than. Mark would come up with. This has happened on many occasions. The most infamous of which was that one race in Cosmic Encounter where you have to ask a question and they have to answer truthfully. Mm -hmm. And you were arguing that they can answer truthfully about their intentions but then change their mind. Absolutely. That's not what that means. (laughs) I'm not going to rehash it, but... You do have very strange... Well, here's the thing. You like to read rules outside of the context of any kind of design. Like, you're reading them so literally. Yeah. And I will read them and say, okay, given that this keyword is in this rule and that there is a different keyword for this other situation, we can assume that these two words mean something different, which is usually right. (laughs) But game designers do not usually write their rule books well. That's also true. Which kind of goes against both of our arguments, but okay. Anyway. That, that aside, messing with the rules is not okay. In my opinion, eliminating a player is generally not okay. It, that's up for debate. 
you shouldn't ever attack another player emotionally. I think emotional abuse during board games is completely inappropriate and should never be done. Was it appropriate in any context? It Probably not, but... Within the board game context. Would you define me <laughs> kind of dragging you to do this podcast a form of emotional abuse? No, Mark. <laughs> it was perfectly acceptable. You took a lot of convincing. I know. But, like, screaming at another player is just not okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then any tactic that completely takes away the fun of the game is also not okay. If I ever would ever employ some kind of tactic that would make Mark or any of the rest of our group upset, I wouldn't use that tactic again. And, and again, that's upset so much that it's upset outside the game bubble, where it becomes an issue because it, they believe that it's really unethical or something that shouldn't be done, period. Right. Um, it I, shows I think... the limits of the concept of the game bubble right. because, in theory, they shouldn't be letting anything affect them. But to me... What's interesting here is that it shows the limits of what we mean when we say the game bubble, which isn't a solid bubble, but is instead just a little bit of an expanding of what's socially acceptable. Because even then, there are obviously things that aren't going to be acceptable. And games are interesting in that they're social activities and they're competitive activities, but even more than like sports, other social competitive activities... They're designed to be more leisurely. However, they can still become incredibly competitive. So there's kind of a minefield of social expectations surrounding board games that we don't necessarily see elsewhere. I guess sports is the only other competitive leisure time activity we do. I mean, there's video games, but, you know, we see all the time in, in multiplayer video games that sh there are social problems mm -hmm. when people freak out and rage quit and go bananas and say horrible things about your mother in board gaming because it's so intimate i think it it's at the same time better in that we don't see as much horrific activity in the context social activity in the context of board games but also a little bit scarier because the potential is so much greater for something to go socially wrong i guess that's all i wanted to say anything else you would deem inappropriate as a manipulative tactic. Those are the main categories. Um, I don't think, I can't think of any kind of recent example where I came across an inappropriate tactic. I think the community as a whole is pretty good about regulating that. And okay. each individual group, again, since it's so intimate, has a dynamic where you don't want to upset your friends or you don't want to upset your fellow game players. Yeah. But I think that people are employing manipulating tactics a little bit more than even they are aware sometimes. All right, tell me what people are doing then. Okay, so a few tactics. And let me know, Mark, if you think any of these go over the line, because I have employed every single one of these before in various situations. You did not allow me to see this part of your notes, so I'm very excited and curious about your list of tactics. Have... You're revealing all. How are you going ever going to win against us now? Okay. I have like four different categories generally of tactics. All right. The Category one. The first is classic misdirection. You want to focus people away from your ultimate goals and motives. And so you put little kernels of, I don't know, knowledge out there that are intended to completely distract your opponent from what you're doing. So you lie to people. It's not a lie. Tactic number one is just... Asking for a rules clarification. Oh, yeah. About something that's completely unrelated to what you're going to do. Or asking people, is this right? Can I do this? When you have no intention of doing it at all. That's devious. So, over the line or not. It's not over the line, but it's really devious. I don't do all of these all the time, but it's something I've done before. Well, also as a woman, you're playing up stereotypes. I guess you're turning the stereotypes around. I don't know. Um, it, it's Stereotypes are weird because they have this circular effect, or at least in my opinion they have a circular effect, where you have the stereotype because it's true of a group of people, 
But then the longer that stereotype is perpetuated, the more of a self-fulfilling prophecy it becomes. So I think women may be more likely to employ these tactics just as a result of social conditioning. And that's something that I'm not... It's not a theory that I've entirely developed, but I don't know. It. I think it's true. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the stereotype that women aren't as good at games or not as good as understanding the rules of the games, that's what you're using against people. And But in our circle, I think it's different because... Well, in our circle, you just our, play the games fewer times. So I we, play the games we understand times, that yeah. you're not as up on the rules. And usually you or Orion or Matt will read the rules first because you're excited about the game. And so if one or two people already know the rules... There's no real point for me reading them, sure, especially yeah. if you want to teach me the game. So I don't think I'm playing up on that stereotype, but I think the fact that I employ this tactic may be a result of the stereotype. I'm not for those sure. those who aren't on the live stream accessed by contributing to our Patreon, I'm giving Amber a very disappointed look right now. It's not working. <laughs> he, he's smiling. Wasn't that a good tie-in, though? I'm getting better at these Patreon tie-ins. Yes, it was good. Do you okay. approve? Okay. Another focus of misdirection is to focus on them. There are times in board games when I really intensely focus on what someone else is doing in the game. I'll ask them questions about it. I'll comment on it. I'll look physically at the board, at their board position, because I'm trying to focus all attention on them. And I think it works. I really do. I think the more attention you can focus on that particular area, the less attention is paid to you. Is this more about looking harmless in the game? Or is it more about using other people's egos to your advantage? It's absolutely about using other people's egos. Are you saying I have a big ego? I'm saying you have an ego. <laughs> Everyone likes to have... What are you willing to admit? No. Everyone likes to have the focus on them, and, and giving them what they want sometimes enables you to get what you want. All right, all know. right. I employ this often, probably a lot. This is going to ruin every game we play with each other now. But maybe you'll get better at board games because you'll start using some of my tactics. Or maybe I'll just go insane trying to decipher whatever subtle hints and clues you're employing. Well, sometimes but since I'm not now, doing any of it. But now we're in a situation where you know the tactic, and I know the tactic, and you know that I know the tactic. It's the resistance double bluff situation. It's bluffs all the way down now. Mm -hmm. And another tactic that kind of it ties into misdirection and it ties into focus is to comment on another player's strength. To make yourself seem weak. There are many times in board games where I am in a very strong position. And I think that people could see that if they look close enough. And sometimes they do see it. But the more I can play up another person's position. Or another person's resources. Um, or another person's just general strength in the game. The better or the less of a target I make myself look. I will say I do use this one. Yeah. Particularly by making Orion look really scary because he's better than all of us at games. Yeah. So there's a natural assumption mm -hmm. that he, in a good position, is in fact the leader mm -hmm. when I might be in an equally good position. Mm -hmm. So I think most people do that one. Yeah. The second kind of grouping of tactics is what I call pushing buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I thought you said you can't emotionally manipulate people. Are you saying you can do it just very subtly? You can do it within the bounds of the game. Um, so, for example, pushing buttons means you really want someone to attack you or you really want someone to attack another player. You make it seem really easy or you antagonize them. Like, there's various ways to do it. It probably depends on the board game itself and what kind of military tactics are involved. But there have been times where I've made it seem really easy to attack me because I wanted another player to initiate it for some defensive bonus or some advantage. When I thought I was, I had the upper hand, um, usually due to secret information in my cards or something like that. 
Hmm. And the other way is just to antagonize people. Um, just poke at them. Putting a place on the a piece on their border, doing something that you th- you think is messing up their particular strategy, even though it might have marginal benefits to you. Uh, you're looking for the long term benefit of getting them to attack you or getting them to attack another player, because you're messing with their strategy and it's not working out the way they planned. Has this ever worked for you? Like you're um, trying to get someone to attack you. It works in Comet sometimes, but that's oh. a very attack-heavy game. I'm thinking of, I'm thinking more of antagonizing someone by poking at their strategy and making attacking another player look more attractive mm-hmm. as an adjustment to their strategy. I think I've done that in. There's through the ages, and then there's another game that's. Uh, Clash of Cultures. Yes, class of class of culture. Can't even say it. Clash of Cultures. Clash of Cultures, yeah. And and then the other tactic that falls under this, uh, which I probably use more recently after certain conversations with Mark, is just generally making decisions that you know they won't understand. I've definitely done this. That's the ultimate secret? Just be confusing? It's it's strategic. It's only done certain times, but it's when you... Want to throw a little bit of confusion into the game. Hoping to throw people off their strategy because they're looking for something that they might have missed. Even when there's actually nothing. I know nothing. I have fallen for this one. There, there's nothing that they should have missed. Because you'll make blues in Twilight Imperium. I'm like, what am I missing here? What knowledge do you have that I do not have? Are you saying in some of those situations there was no special knowledge? You were just trying... To stress me out. In some of them, yes. But you don't know which ones I'm employing this tactic and which ones are real. That's what make the, makes this tactic particularly I'm stressed effective. out right now just thinking about it. Just causing a little bit of confusion in the game can help. So you're saying that for inspiration, people should look to the Joker from The Dark Knight. <laughs> just cause a little bit of chaos. Those are your words, Mark. Your words. <laughs> That's what a lawyer would say. Well, I'm not saying to cause mass chaos. You have to have enough structure so that the you players... You have to cause tiny little stabs of small psychological chaos within everyone's minds. You have to create some doubt in their minds. It weakens them. It, right. it does. If you can throw them off their long-term calculating strategy... Then, if you don't have a long-term calculating strategy, it helps you. It, That's it, fair. It, it's, I get it. It's better um, if if you are playing in the moment to throw something into the, the game that causes other players to think about playing in the moment. Interesting. All right, is that it for the? That's for the second category of tactics. The third category. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay. What was the second category? Emotional so, stabbings. No, no, no. First category was misdirection. Second category is pushing buttons. Emotional stabbings. I'm renaming that one. Pushing buttons, Mark. Okay. Third category of manipulation, and one that certain players have found particularly annoying and maybe borderline, is facial expressions and body language. Oh, yeah. This is dangerous, Amber. Amber. I'm thinking... In particular of one game of Resistance, in which the spies won, but since we were playing with the special, what's it called? Um, Merlin? The Merlin thing, but yeah, in, yeah. in the Resistance terms. I don't remember okay, what it's called. Yeah. Anyways, um, no, 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 no. The, the regular people won, and the spies had an assassin who could choose someone that they thought was Merlin and shoot him. I don't remember That's anything winning bad. The game. Yeah, I don't remember anything bad coming from this. There was a huge discussion at the table in which myself and one other person were the main targets of the assassin. There was much debate going back and forth about who they should kill. And a well-timed smile on my on my part caused Wes, I think, to kill me instead of the other person. I don't remember this. And thus causing us to win the game, finally. He was so mad. Really? <laughs> so mad. Well, because you told him the smile was fake? 
Yeah. Well, he knew it was fake. I'm like, he, he pointed at me and he's like, there is no way that that was fake. <laughs> I don't she remember this Merlin, at all. She is Merlin. You have to kill her. Wow. And it was In the Resistance, fake. I think that's fine. In other games, it may be more borderline. But yeah. that's really subtle. Um, that That's a bluffing kind of mechanism in which facial expressions can be employed. Yeah, it's a bluffing game. In other games... It's more about body language and less about facial expressions, where you appear relaxed at key moments where you don't want people to realize that you're just about to win the game. Oh, yeah. That's really hard to do. It's really hard to do, but it's very effective, too. I try Um, to do that all the time, and I can't. mm Mm-hmm. Or intensely staring at the board or concentrating on something in order to direct attention to that place, which we've discussed earlier in the podcast. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of things, I think, are very, very effective. Well, they're, they're awesome and effective when they're subtle like that. They're not awesome if someone's, like, throwing a fake fit or starting an argument just to divert attention or something. Well, I mean, that stuff only works because it's making people upset outside the board game bubble like you're making people upset for reasons that have nothing to do with the game mm-hmm. and, and again that that's borderline inappropriate uh, or what i would well, that call is, an inappropriate yeah. tactic it, it has to be within the spirit of the game so if you're getting really tense and looking at something intensely the the game should warrant it sure but doing that if nothing is going on is just weird well it wouldn't be Um, effective anyway yeah uh so subtlety is important in that particular tactic all right what's category four category four is what i call diplomacy and it's related to all three of the above but i think it's a little bit different i'm going to call this one not going for the greater good but being selfish instead no that has nothing to do with what it is (laughs) Diplomacy is about making yourself seem like less of a target, Mm -hmm. uh, making yourself seem either weak or strong, uh, depending on the situation. And you're creating a situation and and creating a social impetus for two players to face off against each other, thus allowing yourself to benefit. This always happens in three-player games, so yes. sometimes it's completely unavoidable, and it's not something that you even intend to employ as a tactic. It's just part of the game. Um, well, that's what makes three-player games so incredibly difficult to mm-hmm. design. Yeah. That's why a game like Churchill is so good, because yeah. it has rules, bulky rules, and kind of obtuse rules, but it has mm-hmm. rules to avoid that kind of situation. I was actually reading a game design book a little while ago where it it basically said any multiplayer direct conflict game boils down to that three-player scenario. Mm -hmm. It kind of does. I don't know if I 100% agree with that analysis from the book, but you have to diplomatize in those kinds of games. Yeah, I think that in a game like Churchill, it's so much built into the game that you can't even employ it as a tactic because it's... It's just what you're doing the whole time. Oh, okay. But in other multiplayer games, I think it's accurate to say either... At least me, I'm always trying to create that situation. That th- Where that two free... other people are mm-hmm. fighting instead of you. Yeah. Yeah. And this involves things like not always maximizing your turn, uh, which is kind of counterproductive. No, no, not counter. It's kind of counterintuitive to the way I normally play games and the way most people normally play games, but it can be very effective. Um, I did this a lot when playing Falling Sky. Really? Yes. Where I could have had a stronger military or I could have done more with my turns and actually chose to not get as many resources, not move as many pieces, not place as many pieces. And I think that that was very effective because I did win that game. Right. Well, that's built into the game a bit because... It was built in my to my specific faction. Um, well, it's built into every faction in the coin games because part of the coin games is peaking at the right time. You're, you have to maximize the points you get 
right at the point when the round card, end of round card comes up, because that's right. your chance to win the game. But even more so with that particular faction. Yeah, but I, I will say that I always chose the action that would give me the most options and would maximize my turn, but I didn't always use everything within that. Like, I didn't always place as many pieces as I could, move them, get as many resources, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So th I think that that is a, what I would call a diplomatic tactic, and it's, it's a newer one for me. I guess playing the three-player games alerted me to this dynamic. So yeah. may maybe introducing me to Churchill was detrimental. <laughs> <laughs> We well, will see. well, that's funny that you say that because that, to me, that's the most natural one is to say you want to play in such mm -hmm. as you want to play in such a way as to minimize the appearance of you as a threat. That's the that's, most obvious one. That is, Some of your other things are not obvious to me see, at all. That is completely counterintuitive to me. I play very aggressively. I always want to be in front. I always want to be the strongest. And so this is a newer tactic for me, but it has been very effective. Interesting. Okay, then I want to just quickly bring up a couple of false social manipulation tactics. Things that Mark thinks this, are manipulation that are not. Is this like fake news? It, it, whatever. <laughs> it, wait, wait, so it's... It, it's Mark saying that I'm being confusing and weird during board games. When really nothing is going on, it's just my natural playing style. First is just making spontaneous decisions. Sometimes something seems really interesting and fun and it doesn't really fit in with my strategy, but it looks like it might be beneficial and I go for it. And this confuses Mark to no end, it confuses Orion to no end, I think it confuses Matt too. Ben gets it, because Ben does this all the time. But yeah. What's an example of that? Carcassonne? Well, like Carcassonne, it's it's putting a farmer in a field that doesn't look like it's a good position, but it might be. You never know. Like early in the game? No, late in the game. Like That doesn't make any sense. But it works. I win at farms all the time. But not in your but you waste farmers all the time. By the end But I win. <laughs> okay. To be fair, I think I've beaten you at Carcassonne once, ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by the midpoint of the game, you basically know which farms are going to be legit. But joining up is the strategic part. Well, sure, but that's very difficult to do sometimes. And a lot of times I will place a piece on a farm, knowing that there is only one or two pieces in the entire game that will allow me to join the farm. And I get lucky. Mm. And since Mark believes more in probability, he does not take the risk. Well, it depends on how ahead or behind I was. Because yeah. the further behind you are, the more strategic, high variability plays are. That is a long-time principle that I've held. I have never played a game with this principle in mind. Okay, what's your next <laughs> fake, fake manipulation? Sticking to your guns. Sometimes Mark will criticize what I am doing to no end, saying it makes absolutely no sense trying to get me to do something else. And me being stubborn and saying no is not social manipulation. It's just me being stubborn and saying no. <laughs> well, given how angry it makes me, I think it does qualify somewhat under your manipulation heading. Well, you say it makes you angry, but then it makes me angry when you keep questioning. Well, I think... Like, <laughs> well, how is that different than, like, do a thing just to make them confused? Because it's... I'm not doing it with ulterior motives. I'm doing it just because I am stubborn and want to play the way I am playing. Okay, okay. Uh, in, intentions matter, I think. It, it's not a tactic that I'm employing. It's just the way I'm playing. Okay. Okay. Those are my false tactics. So... Do you have questions? Do you want to flag anything as particularly inappropriate? No, I think this was a, I think this was an interesting learning experience for me because we hadn't fleshed this out before mm -hmm. in our discussions, and now it's going to be even worse because now you know that I know the tactics, so you're going to have a whole nother layer of 
weird emotional manipulation tactics to screw me up the next time we play Twilight Imperium. Or maybe you will start employing these tactics and we'll... But now everyone's everyone's going to know them. I'm publishing them online. The, the cat's out of the bag. I don't think that this is necessarily secret knowledge. I think a lot of people play board games the way I do. Just not you. That may be true. Again, the stereotype is that board gamers are people like me who are kind of analytical nerds. And... You're super analytical, but you come from it from a very different perspective, it, I guess. I don't yeah. know. It, it's really, it's weird because it's really hard between for me us, to think linearly. Well, you are the linear thinker, though, between us. But, it but you do it happen. intuitively. It doesn't happen linearly. It's more like a conglomeration of thoughts just suddenly produce Appear a in a line. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. But yeah, I think that I think that all the tactics that I've gone over are interesting. I think that they help people who don't think super logically and calculate everything out compete well in board games. Like my sister Emily does really well in board games. You know she's not thinking linearly. She thinks more like me. And she, she wins all the time. Not all the time. She beats everyone at Seven Wonders. At Ticket to Ride. Okay. At Ticket to Ride, she just makes everyone else lose because she finds it funny. And in Seven Wonders, half the time, you're telling her what card to play because she always forgets the rules. I think she's doing something similar to what I do. Really? Maybe not as intentionally, but I think she knows the rules well enough to play. Emily, if you're listening to this, which you're not... (laughs) Fess up next time you come over. I think she plays similarly to me. Anyway, this is still very confusing for me and I don't understand any of it from an empathetic point of view. But I do understand more of it now from a strategic point of view. A strategic point of view. And maybe this will help people out there who don't play as many board games like you do. Or it will shine a light on why certain people win. But they don't seem like they should. Which happens all the time in our gaming group. Yeah, yeah. Do keep in mind, though, that it's important for each group to have its own dynamic and figure out what's acceptable and what's not. That's the real game. Because I know I know some of the stuff that I've gone over is not going to be acceptable to some of you out there. That's fine. Discuss it with your friends. Have it out there. Yes. Know that it is happening. Well, it's like I always say, Amber... The real game is life. Oh, Mark. (laughs) I actually tweeted that at Rob Davio the other day. (laughs) They're making some kind of jokes about legacy game, and I said the real legacy game is life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, I have nothing to add. I'm, I'm, I'm usually able to take our topics and, like, break them down and piece them apart and put them back together again but this is all very weird to me so hopefully it's interesting to you all anything else you wanted to to, to add oh yeah i was gonna ask you what's it life like being married to a massive board game nerd (laughs) it's fun because i get to play all the board games but also the table is always messy. We have a dedicated table. We now. are always buying too many games. <laughs> I only bought a couple today. Mark is always trying to get me to play games that I may not want to play. Do you want to play Noara after we're done? No. Dang it. <laughs> but it is very fun. Okay. I'm glad you don't hate it. <laughs> All right. I think that's our podcast for today about. How to manipulate your friends and make enemies in Mark. board gaming. Mark, Mark. We what? Need- I'm on the pun train this podcast. We, we Climb aboard. We do need to find what a more accurate word is for this. I know that I'm sure there is one. I'm not as well read or studied up on this topic, so I can't give it to you. Well, what it is, is it's similar to the behavioral economics idea of what they call it, nudging? Have you heard of this? It's Some accurate. guy in behavioral economics, I think he wrote a book called Nudge, 
I think it was Nudge. Hmm. And it's the idea... Well, it's it's basically the idea of behavioral economics, which is kind of what you're talking about, but on a macro level. Like, oh, like an example. I was driving over to Matt's house the other day hmm. and noticed that there were these big white splotches painted on the road, like mm-hmm. on like on corners. Mm-hmm. And Matt said it's just to make drivers feel like the lanes are smaller so they intuitively slow down. Hmm. Interesting. That's the kind of thing that behavioral economics talks about. Yeah. Which I find super fascinating. This is kind of a weird tangent of that a bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I... I often call this or refer to it in my own mind as keeping people happy while getting what you want. That sounds awful. You, you can't, that sounds worse than manipulation. You, you can't take it too far, but you have to win a board game. I, I'm very competitive at board games, even though well, I yes. may not always seem that way. But you want everyone else to have a good time and enjoy themselves. So basically, you see yourself as the puppet master manipulating the strings of our enjoyment only nudging (laughs) nudging the strings of our enjoyment (laughs) i i I don't see myself as a god or as the master of the board game at all i just want to win (laughs) okay you can decide whether or not to keep that in the podcast whatever you want (laughs) you're not laughing at my jokes you're treating my jokes seriously I didn't get the joke. <laughs> I made so many puns oh, Mark. and references, and it was great. But I think you're kind of nervous because you're on stream, yeah. which is only available to people who support the Patreon. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, I don't think that one was that smooth. That wasn't as good. No. Anyways, that's the podcast. Check us out at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review this on iTunes. I'm at nine ratings right now, which is one below a round number, and we all know how exciting round numbers are, right? That's just you. That's just me. What am I forgetting? Twitter, Facebook, those exist. And Patreon, we talked about that. Orion's not here to remind me of all the social media stuff, and you don't know anything about it. Nope. I don't follow your social media. Sorry, Mark. I'm guess, not on Twitter. I guess it's over then. I'm rarely on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That, is that it? Okay. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs> you took it so seriously. Took what seriously? My letdown of an ending. Oh, I thought you were going to cut that out and then just use mine. You're too serious. <laughs>